I looked back on my notes. We started this book in January. <laughs> oh, we are just speeding right through this book. So here we are in James, the second chapter. The reason it takes so long with James is he gives you the problems without the spiritual solutions. So he presents a good problem, but he doesn't present a good solution. So uh, our responsibility is to present a solution, so it takes us a little longer to get through James. Uh, I'm in verse 1, second chapter, verse 1, because it, it, is the, it opens the main idea of the passage. It's an introduction uh, verse to our context, which is through verse 7. But I'm looking at verse 1 to introduce the second chapter and especially the first seven verses. Uh, he says, my brethren, um, which is really interesting because James was brought up in the Jewish congregation, the Jewish church, to call the people that attended it brethren. But he has a whole different meaning with it now that he's under the new covenant because he's talking about the brethren in Christ. And that's very important. You'll see it as we get deeper into the book. Um, you kind of get it in the first chapter, verse 1. Since we're right there, look out of chapter 1, 1. Um, when he uses verse 1 and 2, he says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith uh, produces endurance. And he goes on with the subject matter. And you'll see him use this word brethren uh, a great deal. And he's, going, he's talking about the brethren who are in Christ uh, and not just the brethren of the Jewish faith. He's now talking about there is no longer Jew nor Gentile, which was a breakthrough in his theology. Okay, so my brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism, which means partiality, prejudice, or bias. Just in case you don't know what favoritism is. Okay? And so we're going to discuss that uh, today a little bit. But in order to do that, We've got to go back and remind you, refresh you on the book of James because now we're about to get into James's theology. Um, and there are some things you really need to understand that James is going through. He writes this book in 45 AD. And he doesn't really get a breakthrough on the principle of grace until 50 A.D. at the church conference. And so you've got two guys that are major guys in theology at this point. You've got James who is struggling with grace, and you've got Paul who writes the book of Galatians in 49 struggling with law. So you have some interesting and wonderful thing is that uh, Paul has grace down, but he hasn't got the law down. James has got the law down, but hasn't grace down. And the key is, and they're both writing books. James writes in 45, Paul writes in 49. They have this great church conference, the Jerusalem church conference in Acts 15 uh, in 50 AD. And it, it, it absolutely had an impact on both these guys' life in regard to these issues. So when you study James, uh, James is in a transition himself, just like Paul is when he writes Galatians. The difference is James's primary book is pushing law, and Galatians is pushing grace. But they're both struggling. And so we're going to talk about that. It's very important you understand when we enter the second chapter, and we're now in, uh, you see, well, I'll talk about it in a moment. My engine is start revving up, so I need to have a word of prayer. Okay? Let's have a word of prayer.
Well, as we often say, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You can't understand it, nor can you apply it to your life in carnality. The evidence of carnality is personal sin. The solution to personal sin, according to 1 John 1, 9, is to confess it. In the confession of that personal sin, God promises you that he will forgive it and cleanse you from it and restore you to spirituality, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, not only in the learning of the Bible, but in the application of it. You need to be a spiritual person. Even babies, even baby believers can be spiritual people. Because it doesn't depend on you, it depends on the Holy Spirit who lives in you. So, Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way to study with us. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God within our human souls, that we, we, our souls might be enlightened to the truth and we might live by that light that lightens our path to all of our decisions. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we need a refresher course, and so my first hour, I don't know how far I'll get. I've got 10 points, so you know how that goes. But we need a refresher course on James in order to get into James in the first seven verses where I'm going in the second chapter. Uh, and so there are 10 factors that I think very important for us to review that are important that we opened up the book with that you've probably forgotten because that was way back in January. And so I need to refresh your mind on that. Notice the second chapter, verse 1. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Notice that the words do not hold is a, is a negative may, M-E, that's a negative, not, with an imperative, a present imperative, which means to stop. Stop doing this. Stop doing this. And what, what, what are they doing? They're showing bias and prejudice towards people in the congregation, and that should not be so. Stop doing that. You're growing in the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not exercising it properly towards one another. You with me? They, they, were, they were respect, King James, they were respecter of persons. We're not permitted to do that. Now, James is in James in 45. Paul is at Galatians in 49 writing his book, writing a book back to the Galatians, the Gentiles. And here's what Paul says in the third chapter of Galatians, verse 28, that James hasn't got a hold of yet in the principle of grace. That in the new covenant, because of the grace of God in salvation and the Christian life, there is no longer Jew nor Gentile, no longer male and female, no, more, no longer slave and free. In other words, see, there are all kinds of social and racial and economical uh, divisions in people's mind. Do you understand that? No more. <laughs> no more Jews and no more Gentiles. So what are we? We're Christians. We belong to Christ. Well, what's the difference? We're new covenant people. So that's, that's Galatians 3.28. That's Paul writing out of the book of Galatians. Here's James in 45 writing, and he's saying it, but he doesn't have a solution in it. What's Paul's solution over here? We are one in Christ. James hasn't been, he, James is not there yet. He's on the way, but he's not quite there yet. So we need to take a look at this. Because what James says, he st says, stops doing that. Don't tell him how or why. Doesn't tell them how to stop it. Doesn't tell them why they should stop it. You learn that out of the Galatians. The fifth chapter tells you you got to walk in the Spirit. And the third chapter says all these social biases and prejudices have been done away with on the cross of Jesus Christ. If you're prejudiced towards somebody because they're of a different color, a different education, a different social, a different sex, yada, 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 I don't care where it goes to, it's done with. Are you with me? That, and now, Paul is writing that out of Galatians, full steam ahead on grace. James is not quite there. He's going to get there, 
but he's not quite there. And so we have to take these two books. When we, when we go through them, we take James. He presents a great problem, gives you no spiritual solution under the new covenant. Paul does, so you bring them together. Okay, so Peter says when you study Paul, and Paul gets into technical theology, you got to do what? In 2 Peter 3.16, you got to put the thinking cap on. So we're going to put our thinking cap on a little bit. Here's the first thing. This is all review, but it's very important to where we're going. You need to understand these writers at this point, really early in the church. The church began at Pentecost in about 30 A.D. Paul got converted in 33. Uh, James gets converted in the 30. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Christ appears to him in 1 Corinthians 15, 7. Personally uh, uh, talks to James, his half-brother. And James is in the transition period of moving the church. Remember, James' ministry was in the transitional period. Paul's was, James gets converted in 30, Paul gets converted in 33. That's Acts 9. And these guys are, are really after it, trying to find new covenant thinking. James thinks that somehow there has to be law and grace kind of mixed in it. And Paul says, no, no, it's grace. But he's not quite sure how law fits in it. What is the place of law? And he's, it's not going to be till the Acts 21 that Paul gets his nose rubbed in it and finally figures out it's all grace, no law. You know why? Because of Romans 10th chapter verse 4 says, Christ is the end of the law. Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, I've not come to abolish the law. I have come to fulfill it, to complete it. It's going to take these guys a while. That ought to be comforting to you and I in our struggle. It ought to be comforting. Here's point number one in review. The book of James is classified in the New Testament as one of eight general epistles. Let that sink for a minute. There are eight New Testament books that, general, that are general epistles. And when you look at them, they're really interesting. So I listed them for you. James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Hebrews. Okay, he and Hebrews. I don't think I put, yeah, I put Hebrews. I missed it. You see that? Now, when you study them, they all have something in common. You take, for example, Hebrews, James, First and Second Peter. What they have in common is that they're involved in the transitional period from 30 to 70 A.D. That's the transitional period of changing covenants, uh, canonization, all that stuff is occurring there. It's a big deal. That's the transition period. You got you to know that. That's a historical major point. Okay? These are called general epistles. They, and, and listen, they're to sh they are teaching you the old covenant, like the book of Hebrews, which we're studying on Tuesday night. The old covenant's out, the new covenant's in. Right? I mean, he pounds that all over that. Shows you the superiority of the new covenant in every aspect of your life. That's the book of Hebrew. The book of James, that's in transition. James is trying to, trying to wrap his brain about that as he writes to the people. First and second Peter, pretty much the same way. Listen to me. James, Hebrews, and Peter are writing to, to Jews in dispersion. That's the importance of that. So there are connections in the general epistles. These are out, and they're trying to pull the the, the Jewish church and the and the and the Jewish church and the and the Gentile church into one mindset. We are one mind in Christ. They're general epistles. 
The general epistles are not directed to any one specific church, but the church in general, whether it's Jew or Gentile or where it's located. That's why they're called general epistles. You really need to pay attention to how the, the early uh, teachers of Christianity broke the New Testament down into this general epistles. So that's very important. The second thing that's of important to us is James addresses his book to the 12 tribes dispersed abroad. Now, we know 10 of those tribes are out to the second coming of Christ. Agreed? Now, we know that historically, prophetically, we know that. 10 of the 12 tribes are out. 70, 722 B.C. under Assyria, they got knocked out, and they will not be back till the second coming. Well, they won't be back till the, till the church is raptured. We're back at the last seven years of the tribulation and headed to the millennium. That's a major issue. That's a major issue. And he writes it. Chapter 1, verse 1, we just read it. He's writing to the 12 tribes dispersed. What does James mean by that when he knows 10 tribes are out? Well, James is thinking Old Testament. When the coming of Christ, listen to me now, this is important. The coming of Christ, there was no first and second distinction. It was just one coming of Christ. They didn't know there was going to be a separation of the first and second coming because the church was the mystery that separated them. Please tell me you know something about that. Having sat here very long, I mean, if you sat here two years, you've heard me teach this. See, these are all key elements in this. So what is James talking about? He's talking in terms of the Jewish idea of the coming of Christ would reunite the 12 tribes. Is that true? Is it true that when Christ comes, he will unite the 12 tribes? Yes, but which coming? The first coming? No, because it didn't happen. Second coming? Absolutely. And so how is he thinking? He's thinking just as he should think out of the old covenant. That's old covenant theology. When Christ comes, the 12 tribes will be united. And so James is talking in those terms. Does James know that there is a difference between the first and second? Of course he does because he's lived in the first. And Christ went back and he said, I'm coming again. So James knows that. Is that not basic? That's 101 theology. And James knows that. But he speaks out of, out of the idea to the Jewish congregation, converted Jews, that this, the coming of Christ, and now we have to understand there's a difference between the first and the second. And James knows that. Now, it's important. Does it not bother you when you read that he writes, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes who were dispersed? Does that not bother you? <laughs> when we know from history that 10 of those tribes are out to the second coming of Christ, does that not bother you? Who in the fan is he talking to? Okay. Well, it bothers guys like me. Yeah, it bothers me. So if it bothers me, I'm going to bother you with it. We're going to try to understand what does that mean, that that stuff bothers me. I'll tell you something else that's important. See the word dispersed in uh, James 1.1? 1, 1? See, this is stuff you can't see. This is the stuff I see, and because I see it, I can tell you what I see. You can't see this. See the word dispersed? It looks like a verb. Does it look like a verb? Well, it isn't. It's a prepositional phrase. I wrote as it is in the Greek language, it has M plus the locative with the definite article and the word dispersed. It's a prepositional phrase. It emphasizes the hope in Christ to the believing Jews of the reuniting of the 12 tribes as a result of the second coming of Christ. 
But James don't tell you that. I have to tell you that because he didn't go out and explain it. And that's why I am your pastor teacher. And that's how you know I am. And that's important to your life. And it's important to mine. All right? Here's the third point that you have to be reviewed on as we enter, enter now deeper into this book. The book of Jane consists of five chapters with 108 verses. Now, I know you probably looked to see how many chapters there were. Everybody who reads a book looks at how many chapters and then figure out how long it's going to take them to read the book. But very few people are going to count the number of verses, except a guy like me. And I'll tell you why I do, because I'm interested in verbs. Every Greek student in the whole wide world who exegetes the Word of God worries about verbs. And you worry about imperatives. How many of them are in the book? We worry about where the Greek sentences are because verses and sentences don't normally, don't all the time run, run correct. So that's the stuff we worry about because we want to be sure we can give you a complete thought about something. So we look at context as well as text. See, that stuff... That bothers good theological teachers. If you're not a good theological teacher, it doesn't bother you because you don't care. You just push it out. I just paid to push information. See, I don't even think that way. I don't even think that way. The book of James has five chapters, 108 verses. Here's what's interesting. Chapters 1 and 2 have half of it. Think about that. There's five chapters. Chapter 1 and 2 takes up half of the verses. Does that say anything to you? It says, boy, he was pounding. He was open to a whole lot of ideas in chapters 1 and 2. That's the reason I came back after chapter 1 and did a review because it took me so long to get through chapter 1 that I thought you would forget. And whoa, was I right. Because, listen, you know how I know that? It's because it bothers me. I got to chapter 2. I had to go back and review because I'd spent so long in trying to show you solutions to the problems created by James, legitimate questions, that I forgot I had to go back and review. And so I bring the review to you because I think it was important to me. I think it's important to you. How else would I know? It should be important to you because it was important to me. <laughs> All right, here's another thing that's important. There are, in 108 verses, there are 54 imperative moods. You know what that is for James? That's 54 commandments. Who, a guy who thinks that way. He's a commandment guy. 54 commandments. I mean, he'd probably been happy if he could have done a congregation to learn the 10. That if you could just learn the 10 commandments, I'd be happy. But he introduces to them 54 commandments. That's a whole lot of commandments in 104 verses, 108 verses. And we have five in our in our in our context. Uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, there are five. Now, you can't see them because they're, they're not visible in the English. They are in the Greek. I'll show them to you, too, because there are five commandments. Fifty-four in the book. Here's the fourth thing that people don't realize James' Bible, you know what he's teaching from? You know what James is teaching from? The Septuagint. That's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. And you know, he's, you know who he's writing this letter to? Hellenistic Jews spread out among the nations. 
some of them under the tenth, under, under the fifth cycle of the ten tribes, and the rest of them being persecuted. Is that important? Oh, yeah, it's important. Oh, yeah, it's important. He uses words like synagogue. The English struggling with this saying, they translated assembly. When Paul talks about an assembly, he uses, he uses the word ecclesia, not synagogue. He uses the word church, not synagogue. James uses the word synagogue in a legitimate way, and he's writing to those out there who are going to the synagogue, and he's trying to get them to understand that we're in a transitional period moving to the church. In fact, the storyline of our passage, verses 2 through 7, deals with two visitors in the synagogue, which is the assembly place of the dispersed Jews. The synagogue. If you study Paul's missionary trips, if you study Paul's three missionary trips out of the book of Acts, you will see that Paul visited the synagogue almost everywhere he went. And as a result of that, he stirred up his hornet's nest, and also almost all the synagogues got after him and beat him to stew. I want you to turn to the book of Acts with me a moment. Let me show you what Paul is dealing with. Now, you ought to write this at the top of your paper on point four. You ought to, you ought to write down there 2 Corinthians 11 because it talks what Paul went through to be a missionary. I'll tell you, most people who go out and play missionary would never go on a second missionary trip if they went with Paul. I promise you that. Because most of the people that go out on missionary trips go out on vacation. You ought to read 2 Corinthians 11 when you sign up for the mission field. 2 Corinthians 11. If you went with Paul, this is what you could expect. 26. I'm sorry. I jumped off. I jumped off the Bible and got on my horse, didn't I? Yeah, sometimes I do that. Chapter 26, I want I wanted, I wanted to show you what Paul's dealing with. He's, before, he's in court before King Agrippa. Agrippa says to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hands and proceeded to make his defense. In regard to all these things, Paul said, of which I am accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I am about to make my defense for you today, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. And then he goes in to talk about why the Jews are so mad at him. Okay? I just want to drop down to verse 7 and 8. This is well worth your read. I'm just trying to cliff note it. The promise to which our 12 tribes... I'm a, look at verse 12. I'm on trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. Verse 7. The promise to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God night and day. And for this hope, O king, I am being persecuted by Jew. What, were they, what was the hope of his promise? That they one day would be all reunited with the coming of Christ. Why is it considered, verse 8, why is it considered incredible among your people of God does not raise the dead? Then he goes into another discussion, drop down to verse 11. And as I punish them often, he talks about himself, and as, a, and as, a, as I punish them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme, that is, 
Christians in the synagogue and being furiously engaged, enraged at them. I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. Look at verse, drop down to 20. But then he goes on for a discussion about it. He says, Consequent, verse 19, Consequence of King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision that he got, he just discussed. But kept declaring both to those of Damascus first and also Jerusalem and throughout the region of Judea, Acts 1.8, and even to the Gentiles that they should repent, that is, change their mind about the source of salvation, and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. Then he goes on with this into verse uh, 21. But the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. And so having attained a help from God, I stand to you this day testifying both to the small and the great, stating nothing but what the prophets of Moses said was about to take place, that Christ was to suffer, that by this reason of his resurrection from the dead, he should be the first to proclaim light among the Jews and to the Gentiles. That's right out of Isaiah 42 and 49. Messianic teaching. Then he drops down to verse 26. For the king knows, Paul said, I am not out of my mind. Agrippa says, uh, uh, Paul was saying this in defense. Festus says, Paul, you're out of your mind. Most excellent Festus, I would utter words of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters, and I speak to him also with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things escape his notice. For this has been done, for this has not been done in a corner in secrecy. King Agrippa, do you believe the Gospels? I know you do. And King Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time, you will persuade me to become a Christian. Paul said, I would to God that whether in a short time or a long time, not only you, but all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. God. That's, that's a missionary out in the field, buddy. There's a missionary. If you want to be a missionary, there's one right there. And so here's Paul out there. This is what Paul preaching on the mission field. And the Jews are persecuting him. And he said, I don't understand it, except for the fact that I, as an unbeliever in absolute ignorance, did the same thing. Here's the point number five. The date of 45 is important to the book of James as 49 is to the book of Galatians and Paul. Because neither of them mentioned the apostolic creed of Acts 15. You see, the apostolic creed designed after the first church conference would have solved most of their problems. It didn't because it wasn't written yet when these books were written. I don't know why people miss that when they try to date these books. When you want to read the whole story of the Jerusalem conference, the first church conference, you can read it out of Acts 15. You should pay special attention to the apostolic creed that was designed in verses 22 through 29. It is well worth your read as a student of the Bible. It has everything to do with these two books. The apostolic creed could have resolved most of these problems, like in Acts 15, 1 through 11, and Galatians 11, 2, 11 through 21. The apostolic creed designed and out of Acts 15 was a big deal. Most people don't even know anything about it. That's a shame. Here's point six. Hey, I might get through with this. I am busting right along, Al. When you read the book of James, you become aware that the Christian church at Jerusalem was still engaged in old covenant theology for the Christian way of life. James is struggling with the grace of doctrine, and Paul is struggling with the doctrine of law. James... In Galatians, the second chapter, verse 9, James is, de is declared to be one of the three pillars of the Jerusalem Christian church. That was primary Jewish, Jewish converts. In Galatians 2, 9, these three pillars of the Jerusalem church was James, Peter, and John. James was the pastor teacher.
when you run the numbers, for example, Galatians 2, 1, Paul talks about 14 years earlier he went to Jerusalem. He's talking about from his conversion in 33, when you add 14, you're at 47. when he begins writing the book of Galatians that's produced in 49, there about 40, 49. He's come back off the, se the second trip in uh, maybe the first trip. But anyhow, he comes back off from that. I think it's the second trip. And he writes his book. In Galatians 2.7, it is very clear to Paul that Paul has been called to the Gentiles and Peter to the Jews. It is interesting to me that the theologians put John 1, 2, and 3 as a general epistle. It makes sense to me after I heard what Paul said having met with the three pillars, James, James, Peter, and John, who wrote the bulk of the general epistles. We know Hebrews is that, and so is Jude. It just, when you start putting all this stuff together, it makes sense. Okay? Point seven. The book of James, Galatians, Acts, and Hebrews, these books show the difficulty of the transition period from the old covenant law to the new covenant grace. When you study these books, as we have studied them in great detail, you learn that right away. We're, on Tuesday night, we're studying Hebrews 8, 9, and 10. And boy, that's what that's all about. The superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant is what it's all about. The Christian church at Jerusalem seems to ignore the importance, watch, the veil of the holies of holies. Remember that? When Christ died on the cross, the veil that separates the holy place from the holies of holies, that veil was, remember, torn down from what? top to bottom. They seem to ignore that. They seem to ignore the fact that when Jesus spoke from the cross, it is finished. What is the it and what is the finished? The it is redemption. Redemption has been completed. Therefore, in, G in Hebrews 9, 12, he says that we now, the new covenant, preaches an eternal redemption. The veil of the temple, the fact that Jesus taught all through his ministry that he did not come to abolish the law but to fulfill it, the fact that Paul writes with clarity in Romans 10.4 that he fulfilled it, he completed it. I mean, you and I preach an eternal Redemption. Do you know that? And yet I hear preachers out there say you can lose it. You can do this. You can't do that. What are you talking about? You need to go back and read Hebrews 8, 9, and 10. And, and listen, if you know the languages, study it in the languages because you certainly can't walk away with that foolishness. That's absolute apostasy to the new covenant teaching. James 2, verse, point 8, James 2, 2, shows that the Jews were still engaged in old covenant worship and rituals. We call it shadow Christology. Listen to what he says. He says, if, that's a third class condition, is using it to illustrate a common occurrence in the synagogue. For if a man comes into your assembly, 
synagogue, that place of Jewish assembly, like in Acts 13, 44 through 50, you ought to read sometime. The book of Acts shows the same principle occurring 30 through 70 A.D. When the, uh, why 70 A.D.? We know 30, but why 70? Because that's when Rome came in and put the Jews under the fifth cycle of discipline until the second coming of Christ. That's why 70 A.D. is a very big deal to the Jew. He put them all under it. Not just two tribes. Right? Not just ten tribes. Listen, he put ten under. We only got two. He put them under. <laughs> uh, I hope you heard me. I hope you heard me. He put ten down in 722. He put the others out in 586 and brought them back and put them out again in 70, and they won't be back until the second coming of Christ when he will reunite 12 tribes. In the meantime, there are no Jews and there are no Gentiles. We are one in Christ. It is the church. I know. I get a little fired up. I'm so tired of hearing about this stuff. It's a great distraction to the ministry of the church. So thir from 30, the death of Christ on the cross, burial, and resurrection, till 78, the fifth cycle to Rome, you have a transition period. Moving out of, look, listen to this. I'm going to give you 12. Yeah, you're not going to be able to write them because they're not going that slow, so you can pick up a tape later. Listen to this. A transition of covenants, old covenant to new covenant. A transition of, of uh, Christology, shadow Christology to historical Christology. A change of priesthoods, Levitical priesthood to the, priesthood, priest, the royal priesthood. From a temporary dealing, uh, the temporary dealing of the Holy Spirit to a permanent indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. We have in this transpiration where some people got spiritual gifts. No, no. In the church age, everybody gets a spiritual gift. In the old covenant, you had a partial complete, you had a partial canon. In the new covenant, we have a completed canon of scriptures. In the old covenant, it was an emphasis on the first coming of Christ. In the church age, the emphasis is on the second coming of Christ. In the old covenant, we were under a temple worship. In other words, that we had to worship outside, but now we worship inside because the body is the temple of God because the Holy Spirit dwells there. We don't go outside to worship. We go inside to worship. Not inside a building. Inside your body is where worship takes place in the New Covenant. People still go. They still go to church or the building. They want to have the decor. They want to have the music. They want to have this. They want to have that. For worship. Worship takes place inside. We're in the new covenant. We're not in the old covenant. <laughs> we ought to be able to worship, listen, next to a river, in a park, in a car, in a house. Worship takes place inside, not outside. We're not about rituals. We're about reality. Well, anyhow. A change from the Jewish age to the church age. A change. No more Jew. No more Gentile. One in Christ. One in Christ. All these prejudices, all these biases, all these partialities, out the door, out the window. Evangelism, not local, universal. Not just local. I came to the Jew, and him first. Not true anymore. We're into universal evangelism. We take the gospel anywhere. It breaks all cultures, barriers, whatever, languages. We take the gospel everywhere. If we have to, we take an interpreter with us. 
and then pray to God, he tells the people the truth. <laughs> See, that always bothered me. How do I know what he's saying? I'd have to have an interpreter for the interpreter. Don't misquote me, Bubba. That'd be my, that'd be, anyhow, here's another one. Divine agency. Under the Jewry, under the old covenant, the priest nation of Israel was the divine agency. You know what the divine agency? Custodians of the word of God evangelism. Today it's the church. We are the custodians of the word of God evangelism. You see, it, from 30 to 70 AD, th listen, I, I understand these guys. They're in a war over this transition, all these transitions. There's a lot of stuff that has to be done. You only got 40 years to do it. Now, 40 years may not seem like a long time. When I look down that corridor today, 40 years is a long time. But I've been promised 120, so I'm looking for it. You say, I don't want 120. What makes you think you have a choice? God decrees. It is God that appoints the day you're born and the day you die. <laughs> Jeez. I just leave it. I, listen, I live my life at expectations. I'm so, I'm so looking forward to what's there for tomorrow and my expectations. Listen, I ain't not retiring and I'm not resigning. I don't know where that come from. Neither of those is true in my life. I've got a bucket list bigger than you could imagine in the kingdom. Jewish believers who were preaching the gospel of grace, salvation, and Jesus Christ were persecuted by the apostate religious Jews as well as the apostate Christian Jews. You ought to read Acts 8 and 9. 9 will pick you up with Paul. Saul of Tarsus. James is writing to these persecuted Jewish believers. And in 62 AD, Jewish politics will murder him like they did his half-brother Jesus. Be careful who you associate in the kingdom because these people are bad dudes. It was a Herod that tried to kill Jesus in the beginning and it's a Herod's little Herods that are still running around killing John the Baptist and everybody can get their hands on. A corrupt group of people, weren't they? What, a, what bad genes they had. You know what? It don't matter what your genes are if you get saved because he'd change them. It's called any man in Christ. Hoo-ah. Here's my final point. I can't believe I made it. I wasn't in a race, but I'm interested. Boy, you're going to love what I'm going to give you the second half, and you're going to have to write. Oh, maybe I can get you a copy if I brought it. I never thought I'd get here. Ten points. Here we go. Here's my conclusion. When we study the book of James, James gives clarity of the spiritual problems, but doesn't give clarity to the doctrinal solutions, grace solutions. Therefore, it becomes the responsibility of the pastor teacher to give these spiritual solutions. For example, in the chapter 1, he tells you to bridle your tongue. But you see, when you go to inner dialogue, you go like, how do I do that? Bridle your tongue. Okay, I'll try. And if there's enough pressure put on your life, your tongue will turn loose. So willpower is not going to make it because what James, what, what the solution is, is 100%, 100% of the time. Willpower can't give you that. Agreed.
we've tried that thing. At some point, enough pressure, two, two or three days into this kind of stuff where they just wear you down, you, you finally let them have it. Right? The tongue comes out and whacks them good. I heard a preacher one time say, the tongue, the tongue of man has enough elasticity in it that you could sit in the living room and clean the skillet in the kitchen. <laughs> I think sometimes it has. Bridle your tongue. So we had to explain to you how to do it. It's not by self-control in the flesh, but rather the ninth fruit of the Holy Spirit is self-control. There's your solution. How are you going to bridle it? What's the bridle? The ministry of the Holy Spirit will bridle it. Then you've got to work on changing your mind about things, about how things work, and how important is it to have Christ in your life solving your problems rather than yourself. Well, let's have a word of prayer. The men will take the offering. We come back. I'm going to show you some things that you can't find in your English Bible no matter how good it is. And they're really important to James 2, 1 through 7. I hope I brought it. I'll, I'll print them out, pick them up on your way back, second half. Have the courage to stay. We're going to give you a donut downstairs and a cup of coffee to help you through. I mean, how good is that? Father, we're so thankful for your love and mercy and grace. Encourage our hearts, Father, in the word of God. Understanding the writer and the purpose of the book and what he's struggling with in his own life and how we can aid and assist because we understand Paul's teaching. We can put them together and have just a magnificent understanding of the new covenant, grace. I pray, Father, as we give our offering today to you, that we don't discriminate against any piece of coin that's put in there. We love the widow's might more than we do the man who gives a little and not enough. And so we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.